You know, we don't always know uh, our elders in the community and we don't always get to know how much they impacted the very free, happy life that so many of us have now mm. um, was because of those women in those lesbian bars in, in the 80s, in the 90s and even before. Hello, I am Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know. Ah, love. Now, usually on this show, when a guest brings up matters of the heart, I'm a little bit like, yuck, let's move on. And maybe it's the summer weather, or maybe I'm just mellowing out in my old age, but this week, I took a different tact and I leant right in. And when I leant in, I learned all about a significant relationship in social justice singer-songwriter Chris Matthews' life, which started all because of the lesbian bar Phase One in Washington, D.C. We talk all about the evolving nature of language, which, as you know, is one of my favorite topics, following your gut, and why lesbian bars are still important. Let's get into it. So, I'm going to ask you a very big question. Okay. So we can park it and we can come back to it if it's right. if it's too early to have this conversation. But why do you think lesbian bars are important? Oh boy, for so many reasons. Um, so for myself, I identify as lesbian. I always try to correct people when they try to do what I like to refer to as the queering of the culture. Um, because it doesn't hold Ooh. space for those those individual alphabets, and those a- individual alphabets actually mean quite a bit to some of us. And so, I think the disappearance of the of the lesbian bar scene is kind of a perpetuation of that that idea of you know women as kind of saying, really just giving the finger to the patriarchy in every possible context. So even within our own community, within our own culture, we still have to grapple with some of those same isms that are outside of our little microcosm. So like we're still grappling with racism, we're still grappling with with sexism and things like that, even within our own community. And so the lesbian bar scene was kind of like bucking up against all of that very early Mm -hmm. on. And so the erasure of those spaces kind of not holding space for that L in, in kind of any context uh, at all. You know, we, we just blanketly say queer when we're talking about our community. A lot of times those bars are, are disappearing and the significance and the history of those bars and what they represented at their prime and heyday. Uh, a lot of that stuff is getting lost within our own uh, community, especially for the younger generations. So I think in one regard, it is important that we are talking about that history um, kind of in a more holistic way now so that people can kind of remember how absolutely badass those women were back in the day, like carving out these spaces for themselves um, and holding on to them for decades and decades and decades, even amidst that same internalized patriarchy that our community mm. has. And then in the face of everything that was outwardly facing them as well. So yeah, I feel really strongly about it. I try okay. to. <laughs> I try well, no, to. No, this is good. This is yeah, good. you know, this is what I, want. I try to support as many of the the spaces. There are still a, a few here and there, but it is. It's fascinating to see just how few there are compared to how many there were. Yeah, um, yeah. Back in like the nineties and eighties. Yeah, and, absolutely. Man. Well, okay. So let's just divert quickly to talk about what you've just said around the erasure of the L from when using the word queer. 
Does that mean you're against the word queer to describe it? Not at all. I'm okay. I'm very, very pleased. My girlfriend identifies as queer. It's very important for people for whom that word feels like home to be able mm-hmm. to embrace that and to be able mm-hmm. to fully live their authentic, uh, truthful selves. 100%. For me, the issue, the difference is when we're talking about our collective community, not all of us identify as queer. Number one, not all of us are even comfortable with that word intergenerationally. Mm. A lot of times that word is very triggering for folks just because of the history of that word being hurled as a slur so often. Yeah. And so it's just a mindfulness thing. It's just, you know, if that's your identity, cheers. So stoked for you. So happy to rock that cue for you. Have my little card up for you at the parade and be like, yes, for the queer kids. But that's not my identity. That's not the letter that's for me. That is not the letter that describes how I love. That's not the letter that describes how I walk through this world. So it's just a mindfulness thing. It's just a, a matter of... I respect you and hold space for you. I hope that you will do the same for me. Ah, see, for me, I just use the terms interchangeably. I know. <laughs> what, I know. What do you mean I know? <laughs> You've been checking up on me. So, it, And it's just a thing. It's like it's such a, a subtle thing that happens. It's like that really, it's almost like an accidental erasure. There's no malicious intent behind it. It's just, again, just not mindful of the fact that you know, we don't all identify that way. And that those alphabets, we say those alphabets because some of those alphabets actually mean a lot to people. Mm-hmm. But it's the same thing with bi erasure. So many uh, people in the bi community, like barely get seen as it is. And then they uh-huh. don't even really get to have that space held for them. Um, so, you know, it's just a thing. It's just a mindfulness thing. Um, so I wanted to ask, how do you feel about the word butch? I love it. I literally have a t-shirt ah. that says butch in big gold letters. And what do you love about it? Again, I'm always going to lean towards giving the finger to the patriarchy in any possible context that I can. They're the worst. And so for me, you know, the idea of being able to know in your bones that I look as handsome in my suit as any other guy and I'm 100% so happy with being a woman and love everything about being a woman and just love the clothes that I love to wear and love the fact that I can mow the grass and love the fact that I can do all of these other things that, you know, people who are my age were always like, girls don't do that. Girls don't do that. Girls can't do that. And it's like, there's nothing about my life that looks like girls can't do. Everything about my life looks like I got this. Do you need help? You know, I just, I love that. It's just like, When I was attending the Michigan Women's Music Festival, you know, which is this whole whole other sidebar about the good and the bad about that. But Mm. one of the best parts about that experience, about those years that was so transformative for me was being able to see so many women who were so confident and proud of their butchness, of their butch identity, of the way that they walked through the world and loved that, like it's interesting now people are like, oh, what are your pronouns? And I'm like, she, her. Because so often you see people who look like me and automatically assume that they're trans or automatically assume that they're non-binary. And I'm like, you need to expand your definition of what a woman is because this is it right here. Mm. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's just this really empowering thing. So I lean into it so wholeheartedly because of that, because it's so revolutionary compared to so many different aspects of popular culture and society. So I love, love, love my butchness. Love it. So do you get that a lot then, people assuming that your pronouns oh, aren't? Yes, ah. every day. People ask me that as often as they ask how my name is pronounced. Wait, is your name not pronounced Chris? It absolutely is. You oh, okay. How often <laughs> I get called Cries. You would not believe it. <laughs> oh, okay. I guess that makes sense. Does it? Well, I mean, can, no, but like, I, can, I can see it. Like I can, you know. Like, yeah. But. So does it annoy you being asked what your pronouns are or is it because the assumption from the person that's asking is that your pronouns are different to the ones that you're giving? It's a little bit of both, I think, but more so the latter, Mm -hmm. just because it's almost like, okay, if we are creating this world, this new, very revolutionary, progressive world where we are trying to break the binary, when we're trying to say to people, you know, women are more than what you assume women are, are we not acting counterintuitively to that by seeing someone like me and assuming that I don't automatically subscribe to the definition of woman? Mm-hmm. So it's just this interesting juxtaposition. You know, it's not a hill I'll ever die on, but it does give me pause often. And I am always very slightly bristled 
when people are like, are your pronouns they, them? No, they are not. No, they are there's, not. There's an interesting layer to it all about age as well, right? Like my assumptions would lean more towards someone having gendered pronouns than non-gendered pronouns. But if I was ever to ask them, I think I would assume that an older person would have gendered pronouns and a younger person would have more non-gendered pronouns. So maybe everyone just thinks you're really young. That's what I'm trying to get That at. is true as well. <laughs> I, everybody thinks I'm so young, which makes my girlfriend so mad because she's eight years younger than I am and everybody thinks we're the same age. <laughs> It, yeah, it is interesting how this expanding of of adapting our language to expand our understanding actually sometimes just reinforces yes, what our that understanding exact is. thing. <laughs> yep. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, it doesn't. It's not like it. It kills me. I mean, I I'm so glad that so many people feel so empowered to be so authentically themselves. You know, my we're in a polyamorous relationship. So my girlfriend's uh, husband is a, is a trans non-binary person. And so, you know, it's affirming to know that so many people are able to be in their skin, the exact way they see themselves and the exact way they experience themselves. That is really beautiful. And so I always hold space for, for folks who identify as they, them, for folks who have pronouns that are different than mine because that is a really powerful thing. I mean, I, I feel mm, like mm. at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is people being able to live a good, happy life. And the easiest way to do that is to get to live your life authentically. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, I don't have a chip on my shoulder about it. It's just one of those ironic things that I think about in the quiet of my social justice mind. And I'm just like, <laughs> we're actually doing the opposite though, guys. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just like, you know, how someone pronounces their name. Like now that you've told me your name's pronounced cries, I'll say <laughs> it like that from now on. Like it's just about... <laughs> Which is it is not. <laughs> oh, wait, what? Huh? <laughs> so let's pick up on the coming out. Yeah. Did, did you grow up in D.C.? I did not. Actually, I'm from southeastern North Carolina originally. Okay. So the south. The south. You can imagine. God. What a time to come out. So, well, I mean, you've just alluded to it, but what was that like for you? So my mom is a preacher. So that made it a little bit more tumultuous than I think it probably would have been uh, on its own, just because, you know, she was very loving and we always had such a phenomenal relationship. But I think as is often the case for parents, so much of the things that go south in someone's coming out process has a lot to do with somebody else's fear. And so like mm. worry about what their friends and their community is going to think about them or people going to say, oh, I did something wrong. This is my fault. So it's like, this very fear driven thing. And a lot of times people just don't have the capacity to express fear in any other way than just like anger and, and hurtful type mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And so my coming out was really, really tumultuous. I came out my senior year of high school and like basically went from second in my class to fourth in my class, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot. And it just, I was like barely living at home. My, my first girlfriend, her family basically like took me in. I mean, I would go home occasionally to, get different clothes and like just try to make sure she knew I was okay. But in general, I wasn't even really living at home my entire senior year. You know, now she and I have a phenomenal relationship. Like I, I tell that story when I'm singing, when I'm performing, because it's so important for kids to know that when people say, oh, it gets better. It's not like just this lip service blurb. That's some far off thing. Like that actually can be your story too. It, it is often um, our stories with our families, not always, but it definitely can be. Mm -hmm. But that took time. That took a, a good bit of time. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for the journey. It definitely taught me a lot about how to engage with people and how to certainly be okay with myself and be okay with who I am. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was, it was tough. 18 to like 23 was really, really rocky, but and, and, I made and so it. What were the steps in terms of getting there? Well, for me, I had the benefit of kind of being her only kid. So it's like, you know, as somebody who was able to experience the world in a place where I could be affirmed and see so many people like me be affirmed. I went to college in uh, Boone, North Carolina, which is like a very 
progressive area. I joke mm-hmm. and call it the lesbian mecca of the of the western part of North Carolina. So for anyone listening, Boone, that's where you want to go. Boone, go to Boone, yeah. visit. It's so great there. <laughs> it's like a tiny little blue dot in the mountains of North Carolina <laughs> surrounded by nothing but red. <laughs> but, you know, I, I got a chance to get that affirmation. And so when you can get that, it's easier to kind of stand in your conviction when somebody is trying to say to you, you're wrong. There's something wrong with you. You know, it's not okay for you to be living this way. And you, you kind of know inherently that that's not true. And you've been able to experience people who also believe that that's not true. And so with her, because I was her only kid, you know, it just got to the point where it's like, I don't want to come home and see you if this is Mm -hmm. how it's always going to be just being really candid with her, like explaining to her, listen, you got to do this work. You are, tearing our relationship apart. I don't have to be down there. You know, you're not providing for me. I'm taking care of myself. So I'm not beholden to you for anything like that. Uh, Until you actually want to have a productive relationship with me, you're not going to have a relationship with me. It's just that simple. And so for her, I think it took time. And then it was interesting because she always has been a mom who says, kids don't ask to be here. So when you have children It's your responsibility to love them. It's your responsibility to take care of them because they didn't ask to be here. You made that decision to have them to be their parent. And so it's your responsibility to love them unconditionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think for her knowing that and living that, it was almost like this mirror that she put up in, in front of her own face at some point in her journey. Because I remember... When I was younger, before I came out, you know, this was like an Oprah's heyday. Oprah would kind of have these groundbreaking shows where she would have like lesbian and gay children on the show. And the parents would just be like, oh, it's terrible. And the audience was always split on the issue. And she would always be like distraught at the notion of these parents turning their children away and distraught at the notion of them, you know, letting their kids be homeless on the streets or anything like that. And so it was such a such an odd experience to know that side of her, like that yes. compassionate side yeah. of her, and then to see her respond with such fear based vitriol when her own child came out. But again, you know, as as we grow and as we're able to kind of see the world as it actually is and not just our perception of it. You know, for her being being a, a minister in the AME faith at that time, you know, that that denomination in general is not very <laughs> open to LGBTQ people even still. And so at that time, you know, to have been one of the few women who was a minister in that faith, to be one of the, the few people who in the community was so highly regarded, and then to have her one and only child be a very, 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 very <laughs> lesbian lesbian was a bit jolting for her. And I can respect that fact. So how do you become a very lesbian lesbian? Like what are the key ingredients? The key ingredients are this, Melissa Etheridge, number one, Uh and Mm -hmm. like circa 1993, Melissa Etheridge uh, in there, like old school Etheridge. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. A lot of sports ball, add that all in there, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. just a lot of things that I cannot speak openly about. You know, it's just as gay as you can Uh, get. How much tofu is involved? (laughs) So much. Even something called nut loaf. It's it's very, (laughs) very lesbian. Very lesbian. Oh, nut loaf. (laughs) And approximately three kittens, right? Exactly. Exactly. Per square inch of the house. Yes. (laughs) Um, Okay. So like having that conversation with your mum, being like 18, 19, 20, however old you were, when that conversation happened which is kind of an ultimatum maybe not quite as as strong um a term as that that must have been terrifying sort of I think because of where I was it wasn't as scary as I guess it could have been um because it like I said you know I was working for myself I had my own job I was paying my own bills it wasn't like I was beholden to her and so I had the fortitude to say I love you I I want us to have a relationship we've always had a great relationship it kills me that we still don't but I'm not going to subject myself to this kind of Mm. heartache every time I come see you it's not worth it to me so yeah you know but had you prepared yourself for her being like okay see ya oh yeah but I mean you know my family is a really big family and I think because I knew in her heart of hearts that she did love me so very much. There was nothing about our life together that ever implied anything but what you always hope a parent's love for a child looks like. Like Mm -hmm. always, always, Mm -hmm. always. Until I came out. And so it was kind of like 
knowing the truth was there and just hoping that she would finally one day wake up and see the actual truth as well, which is that I'm your kid and you love me because I'm your kid and I'm mm-hmm. really awesome. Mm-hmm. So we should Obviously. not be, hung, you know what I mean? So, mm. and she did, she got there, but you know, it, it could have been a gamble, but I think because I knew how much she loved me and she had never given me any reason to think that she didn't mm-hmm. love me. Mm-hmm. It's just that she was scared and, confused and you know all of those all of those things that Mm, make mm. parents make really bad choices so and how did she then get to a place where she could reconcile her faith with (laughs) what you are (laughs) i can only speculate kind of just on some of the conversations that we've had in over the years but for me i think a lot of it had to do with making her peace with understanding that an individual's walk, you know, we talk about an an individual walk of faith, an individual's walk with God versus institutionalized religion. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a difference between someone's own personal faith and going and sitting in a, a building with four walls and hearing somebody else's interpretation, who's not necessarily a prophet in any way, but just has read this text yeah. and interpreted it this way and is now presenting it to you in this way. I think for her being very, very deeply, deeply spiritual and deeply connected with what I think is the true origins of Christianity, which is to emulate Jesus's love, to love thy neighbor, to love one another, um, you know, this commandment I give to you. I think for her being someone, you, you can't, you can't really do both. You can't mm-hmm. say, yes, I believe that. That is the person I want to follow. That is the person I believe everything about this world has to do with. You can't reconcile knowing that and believing that in your bones and then living in a way that is inauthentic to that. So for me, I feel like that was kind of the bottom line of it for her was just kind of leaning more into her own individual faith um, and her own individual walk and not being so reliant upon uh, being in, in some kind of structured uh, organized religion. And I, I, and so the other obvious follow-up question that, that I would mm-hmm. have is if you were, I know we joked about it earlier, if you were like the most lesbian, lesbian child, did she not have an inkling Oh my gosh, I ask myself that every day because I kissed my first girl when I was four years old. Um, I know she knew ahead of time because when I was in fourth grade, I had I had a little diary and literally the only page in that entire diary was one page that said, I think I might be gay. That was the only thing in it. And she found that one day. Wait, fourth grade. So you're like yeah. eight or nine or something. Nine, yeah, yeah okay. nine years old. Wow. Wrote that then, which I'm like, I don't even know where I heard that word at nine years old, but I wrote that in my diary and she ripped it out and threw it out and never, never talked to me about it until I was much, much older. And I knew that the page was gone and assumed obviously that she had found it, but she never said anything to me. And, you know, I never said anything to her that kind of drove home that maybe I shouldn't talk to her about that. So, I mean, I think she knew obviously, but I don't, I don't know. I think it's one of those things where it's just such a foreign idea. You can't even fathom that it could be true. So she never asked mm. me like, you know, are you gay or anything like that until, until it was <laughs> me being like, yes, I'm gay. <laughs> so, which is like this whole crazy story, but mm. yeah, no, she never asked me ahead of time. She never was like, do you think, you know, you like He-Man shoes a lot more than you like Barbie shoes. And like, you never want to be in these dresses. Like, <laughs> Do you have anything you want to tell me? Like, never any of that. Oh, He-Man shoes. You know, I wish they made kids' shoes for, like, in adult sizes. I know. I would still be rocking those He-Man shoes. Mm. They were really great. With Velcro. Yeah. Yes, two straps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so when did you then move to D.C.? So I moved to D.C. in 2010. Yeah, because I had fallen in love with a, a girl from that area and was like right on the cusp of my 30th birthday was like, I'll either move to Portland, Oregon, because my music had been doing really well out there. And I was, I was ready to do that. And then (sighs) you chose a girl over your career. I know. know. (sighs) Sorry, I shouldn't have called her a woman. Well, but that's the thing with songwriting, you know, you can do that from anywhere. Well, yeah, but also like songs aren't as good if you're in love. (laughs) I know. (laughs) (laughs) So you need a little bit of, you know, drama and tension. Some heartbreak and torture. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so how long did you know her before you decided to move there? 
Okay, this is the craziest story. The craziest story. Okay, so the night that I played Face Fest in DC at Phase Phase One in DC, uh, it was part of this festival, this multi day lesbian women's music festival that they were having, and that night I met this girl there. Like walked into the bar, saw her sitting there, and just thought, man, that girl looks. Like she is having the worst night. She looks so sad. So I like walked up to her and was just like, you know, hey, I'm so sorry. I promise I am not being a creep. You just look very sad. And I just wanted to see if I could cheer you up. And so she says, yes, it's my birthday. I'm alone here tonight on my birthday. I just put my girlfriend on a bus. So yes, I'm a little sad tonight. So we just chatted briefly. I played my set. She liked my music. This was back when MySpace was still a thing. She like gave me her MySpace. <gasps> That's and then, commitment. You know, those were the days. Millennials, <laughs> you missed that whole wagon of MySpace. You're so lucky. Um, so I go on, start, you know, we're living our lives. Uh, she messages me. I, uh, this is like maybe eight months later. I'm playing another show kind of in that area. And she says, oh, I'm going to come to that show. I say, fantastic. Not really remembering who that was until after the fact. <laughs> and then she came to the show and because I was, it was like, I was truly was like, it was completely platonic. I had a girlfriend at the time. She had a girlfriend, like, you know, it, it's just, I'm an empathetic person. So she looked really <laughs> sad. So I just felt bad that she looked so sad. So eight months later, she comes to that show. I am at that show with somebody who I, we didn't really date. We kind of had like a thing. It's like this unrequited love thing. Like she's that person in the story of my life. Um, so I was there with her, staying with her, but we weren't together. And so this other girl who I had met at phase one comes to that gig and me being the nerd that I am, when the girl comes up to me at the end of the show and it's like, oh man, I really love that song. Completely oblivious to the fact that she has traveled all this way to see me. I look at the other girl and say, oh, that song is about her, which it was, <laughs> but which is not what she was hoping to hear. You know your audience. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so at this point we're both single, but this was like this other misconnection thing. So then flash forward a few months, even still, I've been playing in Portland. I'm really, really stoked to be moving there. And I've pretty much made this decision with my best friend. We're going to go start this next chapter and just, you know, enjoy ourselves on the West Coast. Uh, the girl that I met at phase one and I, we start messaging every day on Gchat, like from the morning she wakes up, you know, to the time she wakes up in the morning till she goes to sleep at night, just chatting, chatting, chatting. And over the course of the next couple months, she's like, I really want to see you before you leave, before you move to the West Coast, because I feel like once you move over there, I'm probably not going to see you again. So I say, great. So in this process, in this time, I'm trying to find somebody to watch my dog so I can go to Portland, get established, you know, get my, this is before I'm, you know, as successful as I am now. So I have to have like a normal job as well as music. Mm -hmm. So I go over there, get my job started, hoping to, and then I'm going to fly back and then drive a U-Haul across the country with my dog and with all my stuff. But in that meantime, I need somebody to watch my dog. Can't find anybody to do it. My mom, she loves my dog. She is terrified of dogs. She's like, I cannot do it. I don't think I can take care of your dog. She probably won't make it if I have to watch her. <laughs> so... That won't work. My best friend is like, I can't do it, buddy. Your dog is so wild. She doesn't get along super great with my dogs. I can't do it. Meanwhile, this girl has said to me, my parents used to raise dogs. Like they have this beautiful piece of land. If you need somebody to watch your dog, I'll watch your dog. And I'm trying everything I can not to do that because that seems like a big ask for a friend that you kind of just made. And the universe does what it does. Like when there is a path for you, there is nothing you can do to not have that path be the path you're on. Nobody can do it. So I have to say to her, I'm so sorry. I hope you were serious about that because nobody else can watch my dog. Can you watch my dog? She says, yes. I drive from Boone, North Carolina to Northern Virginia. Well, at this point, she's her folks were right outside of Charlottesville. I drive from Boone to Charlottesville area, drop off my dog, and literally never left Virginia. I lived there outside of D.C. for 10 years. It was like the most serendipitous, crazy sequence of events ever. Uh, we were together for 10 years. We got married and we're together for all of that time. And then another chapter in this wonderful saga that is my life was the post-divorce phase. But the starting of us, the beginning of us was a very, very special thing, very romantic thing. But that is how I ultimately ended up in D.C., wow. which I'm grateful for because that's that's kind of what led me to a lot of what my life looks like now was that chapter. So, you know, bitter, bitter with the sweet, but yeah, it's, it's quite a story. Uh, yeah. And it is like the most lesbian, lesbian thing ever. Right. right? Just instant <laughs> U-Haul. Instant. <laughs> so, okay. So that 
phase fest that you were talking about before. Yeah. Was that the first time you ever went to phase yep. one? Yep, ah. first and only. And only. <laughs> first and only. That's the whole episode over then. <laughs> That's it. No, so much changed my life from that night. Oh, what was it like then? Just re-establishing your life with a strange... Oh. Did you move... You moved in. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. So what happened was we had spent... So this was this all happened kind of like uh, a couple of days before New Year's, New Year's Day. So she was at her folks' house. I met her at her folks' house. We had a lovely New Year's Eve together. And then two days after that, she was going to drive back up to the D.C. area where she worked and lived. And so I said to her, we're, we're parked at this gas station and it's like from a movie. Like she's pointing one way to go north. I'm pointing one way to go south to drop my car off so that I can fly. And I'm sitting there in my car at this gas station thinking, man, this feels like something really big. I, I just don't want to leave this girl. Like I'm literally having these thoughts. Like it almost felt like a panic attack. If I'd ever had a panic attack, I'd assume it felt something like that. And so I just drove up to her and I was like, what would you think if I came up to, to Northern Virginia with you? If I came up to DC for a couple of days before I left town and she was so excited. So she was like, yes, come up. And I did. So I drove up the couple of hours up to the DC area in Northern Virginia where she lived and we just had the absolute best time together. Just really, cause I mean, we had been talking all this time, you know, so it's not like she was a stranger, stranger. We just didn't have as much in-person time um, mm -hmm. in front of one another, but yeah. it was like, we just clicked really, really well. And it was very effortless and easy and felt, felt very meant to be. And she felt the same. And so we just kept kind of rolling with it. I kept thinking I would leave, I would leave, I would leave. And, I just never, never did. I never had the inclination to. Like, we just wow. had a very happy life together for a long time. Wow. Yeah, and 10 years. That's such an achievement. Sorry, yeah. I sound sarcastic all the time. I'm not being sarcastic. Not being at general. all. Ten, 10 years is a long time. Um, so if we go back then to phase one. Yeah. What do you think that space taught you about yourself? A lot of, a lot of things. I think being a young, young singer-songwriter... That space was very cool because when you go into a space that has so much history and you see all of the different people who are like you, who have played that space, that same space, and they're people that you kind of look up to and you're just thinking about legacy and about the longevity of a place like that. And it's just like, oh, I want to do this, this career that is not ideal. It's not the thing that inspires mm. a lot of confidence in parents when your kids come home and say, I want to be a singer songwriter. <laughs> but knowing that all of these other people who are also like you, who are women loving women have been able to do this, have been able to make a career out of it and have been sustained by spaces like this one where people can gather together in community and share not just music and dancing, but also festivals and things like that. Because I think that festival lasted mm. through 2017, um, phase fest, which is pretty awesome. And so it's just encouraging. It's just inspiring and encouraging being in spaces like that, because it shows you that there is a history and a legacy, um, and that you, if you're lucky and do a good job, might at some point be part of that history and a part of that legacy. Hmm. And if we return to the question that I asked at the top of our chat, why lesbian bars in particular are important, is there anything that you would want to add to your response? Yes, I think that for younger generations to know that when you look at the whole scope of women's history, especially here in, in America, so many of the more transformative movements, more rebellious movements involved these not afraid of the patriarchy, so ready to show up and speak out against injustice women. And a lot of those women were lesbians and a lot of those women were gathering together in places uh, like phase one and in lesbian bars and places like that. Like there's this huge, huge history of those spaces being almost gathering grounds for so many women who were just fearless, who lived their lives mm. the the most authentic way that they could, um, who were fully themselves and showed up in all of these spaces and drew strength from one another in community in those spaces. And there's a lot of power in that. And so I think that's also for me why it's so sad to see so many of them disappearing is because a lot of that part of the story gets lost as well. 
You know, we don't always know uh, our elders in the community and we don't always get to know how much they impacted the very free, happy life that so many of us have now mm. um, was because of those women in those lesbian bars in, in the 80s, in the 90s, and even before. You know, they changed a lot about the world. They changed a lot about popular culture. It wasn't just about dancing. It wasn't just about the music. They really, there is a history there that I wish could be preserved in a more tangible way because I think the younger generation would draw so much power and support from knowing about that. And bottling up that energy and that passion, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they're going to need it. If this mm. year is showing us anything, we are in for a world of needing that energy. Well, on that happy note, uh... <laughs> do you have any memories of phase one or clubbing from your own queer scene that you want to share? Well, if you do, please get in touch. I want to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing. Go to lostspacespodcast.com and find the section Share a Lost Space and tell me all about what it is you got up to. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Lost Spaces Pod. Find out more about Chris by following her on Twitter and Instagram, where her profile name is Chris Matthews. And that's Chris, C-R-Y-S, not C-H-R-I-S, Chris, not Chris. Okay, you got that? Also, make sure that you check out her most recent album, Changemakers, which is out now. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on your podcast platform, or just told people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. Lost Spaces.